After visiting Zuma J. Jefferson in Malibu, he suggested that I go to the Payson Library at Pepperdine University to see the surfboard room, which would contain the John Maza surfboard collection. And boy, what a treat that was. Of all the surf museums and surfboard collections that I have visited in Southern California this week, the John Maza collection here at Pepperdine University's Payson Library does the best at showing the evolution of surfboard design from the 1900s to the 1980s. This is a locked collection and might require contacting the library and or John Maza ahead of time to access this surfboard room. The simplest way to see this collection is to Google John Maza Pepperdine and it will give you a virtual tour of the boards in this collection. What I'm going to do in this video is focus on some of the board characteristics that are more interesting to me. For instance, in this early, probably 1920s, plank style board, notice the metal bumper at the top nose of the board. Fascinating. These early hollow paddle boards uh, also seem to incorporate designs relative to people who understood airplane wings. And because these boards were hollow and possibly the glues were not all that great, uh, this board incorporated a way of draining water from the interior of the board. This is one of those hot curl surfboards innovated by John Kelly and Wally Froiseth. They had had difficulty turning the square tailed boards in bigger surf and were looking for ways to turn the board without having the tail slide out in the bigger waves. This is one of those square tailed boards that they had trouble turning in the bigger surf. This is a Bob Simmons board. Bob is credited with uh, adding spoon to the nose of the board to help prevent it from purling in the surf. Joe Quigg and Matt Kivlin worked with Bob uh, and suggested that he go to lighter woods, perhaps balsa. On this board, uh, Bob attempts to put some slots on the rails of the board to make it ride longer on the wave, hence called the Bob Simmons slot board. You can see that this slot board does have a rud rudimentary skeg as they were trying to control the boards in bigger and bigger surf. Bob Simmons lost his life at Wind and Sea, but Matt Kevlin and Joe Quigg continued to design lighter and shorter boards that were more maneuverable in the Malibu surf, the Malibu chip. This next board is a Woody Brown balsa board uh, influenced by the hulls of canoes. You can see the shape is beginning to refine itself more into a modern surfboard shape. And again, we find that the skeg is becoming a more relevant fixture to the back of the board. This board was built by Joe Quigg for Buzzy Trent. Uh, when he first built it, Buzzy claimed that the board was too narrow. So Joe went back and added a one inch stringer down the middle of the board to give it a little more width. And if you look really, really closely, you can see the stringer there in the middle. This board was built by Hobart Alter of Laguna Beach. We know him professionally as Hobie, and Hobie surfboards became probably the primary dynamic force in mass-producing surfboards. While we know that Dave Sweet probably built the first foam and fiberglass surfboards, uh, Hobie again had taken it to a new level with his production and his opening of stores in uh, the middle 50s. We again see that the skegs are becoming a bigger and bigger feature on the tail of the board. This Yater gun was shaped by Pat Curran in 1959. Uh, he had abandoned the West Coast and come to Hawaii and became a sort of a leader of big wave riding. Sophistication of the design now and also the skeg and also what looks to be maybe a rudimentary leash holder here at the back. We can also see the addition of stringers down the center of the board to give the board some strength so that it wouldn't buckle or break in the bigger surf. 
with this Pat Curran gun, we can still see that there's not much spoon in the board. It's still a fairly flat shaped board, uh, which would make it fairly difficult to ride steep waves. This board is a 1962 Rennie Yater spoon board where we can see we're adding a little more shape to the belly of the board. One of my earliest boards is also probably a middle 60s Yater surfboard. We begin to see the boards here as craft, function, and art form. John tells me that this is probably an early 1951 or 52 Velzi board that somehow got into the hands of a prop man. Three coats of paint later. As you can see at the bottom here, it's signed by Kathy Conner, who was the original Gidget that the story was uh, drawn after, and a later Gidget, Sally Fields, and also signed by Dale Velzi. The skeg here is probably early 50s also. Uh, and the board was probably never really meant to be surfed in the Gidget movie, only to be used as a prop. The Gidget movie and Endless Summer popularized surfing around the world. Phil Edwards was given his own model board design by Hobie Alter. You could order a board exactly to Phil's dimensions and become the rider that Phil was. This is a legendary inter-island board from 1963 a George Downing board. We can see that the big wave shape has finally reached its peak. A beautiful board and that the skeg is fairly refined and given some shape at this point. Tail block almost to the pintail design. What we have here is a 1966 John Kelly inter-island gun. John Kelly had been shaping boards from the 1930s through the 60s, probably most known for the first hot curl design where they rolled the bottom edges of the board. You can see that the, this hydro design in the skeg and the, the lift of the bottom V area Although we've called both of these boards big wave guns, now we enter the area of the rhino chasers at Lightning Bowl, where boards were specifically designed to attack the outer, outer reefs off the north shore of Oahu. They appear to be in the 11 foot range, very narrow tail, very narrow back area, built to try to paddle fast to get into the wave and then hang, handle the dynam, dynamism of the wave. Again, the skeg has a basically fluid shape, shark fin type shape, uh, which had been pretty common through the 60s and into the 70s. This is a Lahaina, surf, Lahaina surfing design from 1967, uh, built by legendary shaper Dick Brewer. This is Jock Sutherland's Plastic Fantastic Surfboard from 1969. You can see the shapes are getting much more pointy in the nose and the tail, and much more thinner with downdrafted rails. You had to be quite the athlete to perform on these boards. They were very fast and very skittish. You can see that the skeg is being uh, honed down to a much more refined, less drag, easier to turn piece. We all know of the Jerry Lopez lightning bolt boards. Jerry Lopez, Mr. Pipeline. Uh, previously, Jock Sutherland had been Mr. Pipeline, then Jerry Lopez, and later Butch Van Arslan. Uh, but this, these downturn rails and fairly thick center allowed for catching the waves and usually a lot more speed and maneuverability on the wave.
finally by 1981 we have Simon Anderson from Australia who took the downturn rails, the short board, and added the thruster fin setup, the three fins that allow surfers to hang into the rail, hang into the steep section of the wave bitter and to drive their turns off the bottom using all three points. It's been an absolute joy to see this collection. It's really not open to the general public. It's part of a special surfboard room in Payson Library at Pepperdine University. Among other collectors like Dick Metz and Mark Fragali, uh, we really need to thank John Mazza for putting together this wonderful collection. As I said before, surfing represents craftsmanship, function, and art all brought together. And then we begin to weave in the wonderful personalities of all those figures we've learned to love and know in surfing history. <laughs>